Hello and good afternoon from Geneva. This is Simon Russell at the Global Protection Cluster. Uh, welcome to this webinar on the ICRC Professional Standard for Protection Work, the third edition from 2018. New professional standards were developed in a high a large number of organizations who you see listed on the screen now, including the Global Protection Cluster. Uh, what I'm going to do this afternoon is to introduce Pilar Jimeno, who is the head of the Protection of Civilian Population Unit at the International Committee of the Red Cross here in Geneva. And the current project manager for the Protection Standard for Protection Work in that capacity manages a project to disseminate and this webinar effort. And Catherine, the head of the Danish Refugee Council in Copenhagen, make a presentation about the content of the professional standards. She's already shared with us her uh, emails on the screen. Uh, Catherine, I hope you're listening and, and understand that that's what's happened. Um, but we've, covered, we've tried to cover that up. Um, we'll also be joined after that by Helen, who is a member of the Danish Refugee Council Global Emergency Team, uh, working in a project known as Impact, and she'll tell us what Impact uh, means. And then Alexis Selenon from the Finnish Red Cross um, will talk about work and the usefulness of the professional standards in supporting migrants in irregular situations. Finally, we have Kaya, uh, who is the coordinator for the community. And we'll take some questions as well if people have them. So we hope to wrap up. Um, within about 45 to 60 minutes, um, and we'll start with Pilar. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much, Simon, and the GPC for organizing this webinar. Uh, indeed, we have had a launch of the standards in April this year. Uh, it was a great event with the participation of all of the advisory members. And now that we are uh, releasing the versions in French, Spanish, and Arabic, uh, in January 2018, uh, we thought that it was a great opportunity to actually uh, launch globally the standards via this webinar. And I think that the best way to actually introduce those standards is actually uh, via a video that um, we prepared with all the advisory group members uh, and that actually reflects all the changes, the good additions of uh, this 2018 professional standard for protection work. Um, uh, guide. The standards unify us as a professional community. Uh, they are built out of decades of practical experience and give us a common language and shared concepts to inform our work. Since the last edition of the professional standards, we have a new statement by the Interagency Standing Committee about the importance of protection to humanitarian action. And the IASC has said that protection is central to humanitarian action and it should be the outcome of our work. This is already the third edition of the professional standards reflecting the evolution of our reflection but also the evolution of the challenges that we are facing in the field. So we started just over two years ago uh, with the advisory group, a group of agencies, NGOs and UN agencies involved in both humanitarian and human rights work. We started together to reflect on what were the areas of the documents that required revision. A second step was a much broader consultation trying to reach out to uh, practitioners in the field throughout the world to gather their views and opinions to give us some input to criticize the draft documents that we had uh, prepared and to try to ensure that what we were proposing effectively reflects the consensus of practitioners. What OECHR values in this edition of the standards is that uh, it reflects uh, better the perspective and um, specificities of human rights actors who can recognize their work in the standards and this happens in many ways throughout the standards 
standards, uh, for instance, uh, uh, with uh, the examples provided, uh, the uh, terminology used uh, with references to human rights concepts, uh, or simply by referring uh, equally often to human rights as well as humanitarian actors. The standards reflect more uh, uh, protection work that typically human rights actors undertake, like the promotion of accountability for violations, access to remedies, uh, or uh, advocacy uh, to change laws. One of the greatest strengths of this new edition is really about the engagement with multiple actors, the fact that the, um, the guidance itself is really geared at both um, humanitarian and human rights actors, but also um, there's new guidance guidance around engagement with multinational forces and peacekeeping forces as a reflection of the, um, the current operating environment. In the first chapter, there is a reinforced link that has been made between non-discrimination and impartiality. And I think it's very important because in a true humanitarian action, there is a need for it to be really impartial. And it's not impartial if it does not take into account the needs of the most vulnerable that must be tackled first. Another part which is, I think, um, a, a great step forward is the, um, the pro uh, our discu discussion of the project cycle and causal logic and identifying risks. I think that we're a lot clearer now than we were before. In addition, the chapter on managing projection strategies now includes more specific standards and guidelines to work towards protection outcomes. For example, through continuous and context-specific protection analysis, striving for complementarity with other actors, and the importance of learning from our experience to feed into strengthened programming. Chapter 3, the protection architecture, where there was an addition related to uh, the role in protection of non-stated army groups. And I think it's really important to consider not only the protective role of usual actors, the usual suspects in the world of protection, but also uh, the responsibility of non-state armed groups in protection. Working in a complementary way with partners is important because by some estimates, 130 million people live in fragile states or in need of protection, of whom 65 million are internally or externally displaced. And no one actor can deliver protection services to all of those people and we need to work in a complementary way, ensuring that all our strengths are used to deliver protection. We have worked hard in this revised third edition of the Professional Standards for Protection Work to reflect recent developments in technology, in law and regulations, particularly on personal data and data protection. And in particular, Chapter 6 and its annexes addresses a wide range of information technology issues and provides guidance on their use. And we're definitely going to incorporate this guidance into our staff trainings and field work. It is critically important to counterbalance the need to obtain information and give voice to victims of human rights violations with the need to ensure their safety. Beyond the main document, we have developed a set of uh, companion documents. So there is a shorter version that is more synthetic and more accessible for field practitioners. There is also an e-learning available online. And finally, there is an app with uh, full access to the standards on mobile devices. I just share with you the resource page of uh, the professional standards that includes, uh, along with the video, the other uh, support that we created for the dissemination of the standards. Uh, so the link to a specific web page that contains the, the standards in a much more um, web-friendly format, uh, as well as the link to the abridged edition. So I hope that uh, you can visualize maybe the, the video later if uh, you have time. Um, I just wanted to put a little bit into perspective the, uh, the changes within which these standards have evolved uh, since the first edition released in, in 2009, before I give the word to actually the people who are today um, carrying out the work of applying the standards in the field, because actually the um, whole aim of this webinar was to provide with some practical uh, examples of how these professional standards can be and are being operationalized and disseminated within field practitioners. Um, so we've seen in recent years an increasing conflict 
and increasingly urban conflicts is taking a heavy toll and presenting new challenges for protection actors. These conflicts are also protracted. Uh, we see the word very often these days, but uh, it is true that we can see that we're not only responding to emergencies, but actually we're having to remain in contact for a long-term basis. We're actually seeing also an increase in internationalization of conflicts. And with this, we also see an increase in the protection needs of populations affected by crisis. So today, about 2 billion people are affected by fragility, conflict, Five point three million people that are displaced by violence and conflict um, these days. About 2,500 migrants died this year crossing the Mediterranean. And I could go on uh, citing numbers, but as a result, what we're seeing is that both international and non governmental organizations in humanitarian operations are increasing the number of humanitarian personnel present in those conflict situations. We're seeing non humanitarian actors, including the UN Security Council, Human Rights Council, member states, peacekeeping operations, as well as development, human rights, and peace building organizations being complementary uh, um, and working on protection in many other contexts. And the other groups of professionals as well, including health personnel, lawyers, journalists, but also private actors that are gradually becoming part of the protection act. So we're seeing that the architectural protection is being more and more complex, and the need for of, of the work of protection is becoming more urgent today. We're also facing as protection actors many challenges uh, and different challenges today. We have important restrictions in access to affected people. We have national and local organizations that are complementing the work of international ones uh, because of the problems of access and they're undertaking activities that are not being covered neither by the state nor by the international we have seen also a growing resort to creative ways of working, such as remote management and the use of new technologies, something that we didn't have in the past. And there is also a mentality change uh, within the humanitarian sector. We're going from providing aid to actually uh, facilitating people's access to help uh, and enable self-help. So protection practices uh, increasingly reflect the rights and the capacity and also the desire of affected communities and individuals to engage and be engaged in international humanitarian efforts to enhance, to enhance their protection. So we see this as an increasing need for standards and for guidance to protection practitioners and for all humanitarian actors to actually, that actually have uh, to engage with affected populations that may have a protection outcome uh, or protection impact on, on people. Given that, uh, I think that uh, we have as, as protection actors a double task. First, to uphold the moral duty to do protection work to the best of our ability and without causing harm. And second, we have to be conscious that the scope of the effort uh, will remain very limited if uh, the states do not assume the responsibility of primary duty bearers to ensure they work um, so that we have also responsibility to not replace but also uh, and undermine the efforts of the states to protect people but that we actually so this uh, I hope highlights the importance for um, working towards having uh, standards of protection and, and professional uh, actors that understand uh, the protection work and that uh, actually are able to uh, do no harm and protect the people. And with that, I, I thank you. Thanks a lot, you know, for that, for that overview and the, the reason the need for the, the professional standards. I'm going to turn now to Catherine Stara of the Danish Refugee Council. Uh, Catherine, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Simon and Pilar. I hope that I'm now able to share my... Coming up. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Is it up? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, I wanted also to give a little uh, brief on, on uh, the efforts that we have made in this third edition of the Professional Standards for Protection work and, and the process we went through and indeed the challenges we, we sought to address in this revised version of the, of the standards. So as Pilar was also alluding to, I mean, we, we know and we are challenged in today's armed conflicts characterized by violence and tar the targeting of civilians and communities and that indeed 
thus called for a strong, coherent, and at least shared principles and standards. And that is what indeed we need to take action to prevent and to respond to protection risks and to contribute to protection outcomes. I would argue that these professional standards for protection work have already proven their worth uh, because they provide the set of minimum standards on which we are and must build our protection work. What we did in the, the advisory group, which as Simon was saying, uh, was led and is led by ICSC and comprise humanitarian and human rights NGOs and UN agencies, what we did we went through a two years uh, intense discussions and collaborative work uh, to revise and update and, and further develop uh, what we see as a, a stronger and revised and new set of protection standards. Not only, and that this is important, not only for protection and human rights workers and practitioners, but these professional standards for protection and with the centrality of protection and that commitment commitment to ensure protection at the core of humanitarian action, these standards are indeed highly relevant for other sectoral colleagues and for our colleagues in communications, in policy and advocacy uh, work. I wanted to uh, further to Pilar's uh, overview of the challenges that we are confronted with today uh, and in our protection work. I wanted to uh, boil this down to basically three challenges uh, that we have seen in terms of, and that we wanted to, to address in, in the professional standards. So the first challenge of the three is uh, our ability to take action in very difficult environments and situations. And that includes our ability to understand and, and acknowledge the roles and responsibilities of the duty bearers and their mandates, including also armed non-state actors. And it's not only to understand these roles, but also to make sure that we base our work on the legal frameworks relevant and applicable in the specific context within which we work. So this challenge about how we take action and how we make sure that we are able to maneuver in these very difficult situations and environment, those are standards that cut across several chapters. So that was the first uh, challenge. The second challenge was around ensuring we indeed produce results and that we move towards protection outcomes. This is very much uh, the focus of chapter two, uh, that we indeed ensure that we have a results-oriented approach to our work and that we do a sound and solid analysis and we set our priorities and from our strategy, we move towards producing protection outcomes. The last challenge, and importantly, was how we build the evidence how we make sure that we have captured all the complexity of the context within which we work, what the protection issues and what the protection needs and risks are, and how in, in, in that process of building the evidence for our protection response, how we manage the data in a safe and responsible and purposeful manner. So that's what you will see captured in chapter six. So just to look at them in terms of those three sort of areas of challenges and themes that we worked on in the advisory group in revising and updating the professional standards, we have focused and further strengthened the standards around engaging with UN peacekeeping uh, pe peacekeepers and other, other multinational forces, the engagement and interaction with non armed non-state actors, and also the, the challenges and restrictions we see around counter-terrorism measures. So those are standards that we have strengthened and further developed and that cuts across several chapters. The second challenge in terms of how to manage protection strategies and, and move towards protection outcomes is captured in chapter two, which now has an even stronger results-based uh, protection uh, orientation, if you like strengthening and, and ensuring that we have a strong link between our analysis, the strategy setting, and the protection outcomes. And that we make sure that the protection analysis is not a one-off, it's a recurrent thing that we do, and that we make sure to solidly monitor and evaluate our protection mm -hmm. response. The last challenge is uh, captured uh, in chapter six, which now is longer than ever, 
but also a very comprehensive and I believe very useful chapter, very concretely addressing some of these challenges that we have seen around the use of new technology and methods, the use of drones, the remote monitoring, the use of mobile devices and so forth, digitalization, the challenges around uh, data breaches, the right to privacy, and all the new and uh, recurrent uh, law and regulations that we see develop, being developed these years, including the global uh, data protection uh, or the general data protection regulation. What we also saw was the need for on, on all these different types of data that we work with, because there is indeed a, da a difference between personal data other sensitive protection data and information and so forth. So what you can find also in chapter six is also conceptual clarity on some of these issues around data and information management and how we make sure to manage data and information for protection outcomes in a safe and responsible manner. Lastly, the chapter is also linking up to other data initiatives as they run, and there is this data initiative on protection information management, so also building from other initiatives and the principles and the, the process and the, and the frameworks that have been developed under these. Looking to how to put use, and I'm looking very much forward to hear from our and learn from our field colleagues in terms of how the professional standards for protection work are being put to use concretely on the ground every day. I would argue that there, I, I see and uh, there are a couple of different areas within which we are already and we continue to put the professional standards for protection work to use. I think it, it, it's useful maybe to, to, to look at the standards as a set of standards that some of them are, are very fundamental in terms of, for example, uh, working with the duty bearers and holding them to account and, and being uh, clear and understanding who has what roles, building your protection work on the legal frameworks. These are found fundamental standards that cut across the whole, uh, the whole book. And then there are also a sort of other more concrete, what would we could call operational standards. And that's, like, for example, the standards you see in chapter six, very concrete hands-on standards on how we manage data and information for protection outcomes in a safe and responsible and principled manner. In terms of making use of them, I mean, what what is very helpful, I find is, and that's in, especially in chapter two, is how the standards now apply throughout the whole, you could call it the protection program cycle, if you like, throughout the whole process of assessing and analyzing, the setting your priorities and the resulting re protection response and outcomes. So having standards that apply throughout the whole protection program cycle. Further, the standards are also highly relevant and we use them uh, to a large extent in terms of feeding in and informing our policy making within protection, our very more concrete uh, SOPs and, and guidance. We use them in training and capacity building because in essence this is about uh, being able to apply them and, and, and use them and adhere to them. So this also requires uh, strong efforts in terms of building that capacity to, to, to work with the protection standards in practice. And lastly, I would say that we also use the personal standards for protection work to, to inform and as the foundation for our advocacy efforts. I'll leave it here uh, and thank you for the opportunity and I look very much forward to hear from the field colleagues uh, in terms of their experiences of applying the professional standards for protection work. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm going to turn now to Helen Brook, who's um, the head of this, uh, the DRC's emergency team known as MPAC in Cameroon. Uh, Helen, uh, over to you if you're there. Helen Brooks, are you there? Okay, we're going to turn now to Alexei Selina from Finland, from the Finnish Red Cross. So, um, uh, hello, everybody. If you can speak up as well, that would be great. Okay, I can try. Um, hello. So, um, I, I noticed other Helen and, and uh, Thierry with a uh, big package of, of so uh, people with lots of experience, but, but uh, 
I will perhaps lend a little bit different perspective uh, from, from a different context. Um, I personally heard the word protection for the first time uh, about a year ago. But now, uh, throughout the November, I have had an opportunity to participate in a pilot exercise for professional protection standards in practice, which was organized by the Norwegian Red Cross National Society together with the ICRC. And the aim in the exercise was to enhance the understanding of the protectional standards among the participants, but also to apply them in, in a chosen project that we had enrolled for the, for the exercise. And, and now I was invited to, to, to describe this process a little bit in this event. And, and I will first say a few words about the exercise, if you will, and, and then portray how I found the professional standards applicable in the, in, the, in the program that we have in the Finnish Red Cross that targets migrants in irregular situations. So uh, about the exercise, there were several national societies that participated there in the exercise, but mostly from the Europe. And, and uh, even if all enrolled programs were domestic and then executed in the context outside of a conflict situation as such, most standards uh, proved to be quite applicable and, and give good guidance in, in the context of a Nordic welfare state as well. Uh, the method in the exercise was pretty straightforward. Uh, we worked uh, on an online platform for a couple of hours per day and during a four week period discussed some of the most relevant points of the standards and how they would apply in, in, in our various contexts. In addition, we drafted a protection plan and commented our colleagues' plans and finally modified our own protection plans according to the feedback that we had received. And I think this message was uh, uh, really a success and especially so for three reasons. First of all, uh, it, participation in the exercise made it absolutely necessary to allocate a certain amount of time for considering the protection aspects of our program in a very systematic and structural manner so that we could produce a protection plan. And that is something that, that could easily be ignored in a program where providing support or some sort of a service or humanitarian aid uh, could be the, considered as a primary goal. Second, uh, the tasks that were included in the exercise called attention to the protection gaps, uh, to those points where the, our program fell short of the professional standards. But in addition to this, uh, the task also required us to determine actions that remedy the situation and mitigate against risks uh, and, and to the short timeline for exit changes. And I find this is really important in order to materialize uh, the, the, uh, the, the change and then actually uh, make a concrete change in the program that will work. And finally, third, uh, not least importantly, uh, the support that we received from, from our colleagues, from other national societies, but also from the ICSC and Federation was uh, very important. Uh, not least so because sometimes uh, any any uh, support from uh, from from uh, collegial support from experts could be um, very thin in the context that we work in. So, but now moving to the to the program itself uh, and the application of the standards, just to give you a little bit of the context in which we work. Uh, 2015, uh, as we know, the migration situation in, in Europe and in Finland changed quite dramatically and the number of asylum seekers in Finland, for example, was tenfold uh, compared to the previous year. Uh, at the same time, uh, not as a consequence, but anyways, uh, opportunities to get a residence permit in Finland were curtailed to a significant extent. And as a result of this, uh, there, there were maybe for the first time a large number of migrants who started to end up outside the public support network that is run by the state and municipalities. The reception services were, were, were uh, reasonably well taken care of and Red Cross was called to help there as well. But, but uh, after, after migrants received their negative asylum decisions and expulsion decisions and stayed outside the asylum services, 
uh, then they were left to the minimum services provided by the state and the municipalities uh, that, that provide for only for the minimum needs of ex basic needs of existence and then those are sometimes even quite difficult to access in some municipalities. So this was the background situation when we started. Uh, and now in 2018, we have a dedicated program for the purpose of supporting migrants in this situation. Uh, the support that we provide to migrants uh, is, is uh, mainly place of rest and nourishment information, uh, some guidance and social support to main maintain functionality in that challenging situation in which uh, many of the migrants uh, with mul multiple vulnerabilities find themselves. We have uh, modified our system on the basis of Swedish Red Cross, uh, Red Cross House, Red Cross Hus. Um, we also started and then have been all the time uh, conducting referrals to, to the public sector and other organizations uh, working in Finland, uh, especially for healthcare and, and, and social services purposes. So in, in practice, we have actually adopted uh, a minimum protection approach where, where uh, we address the protection needs of those persons who we meet in the context of, of other uh, support services that we provide. Um, we're going to try uh, Helen Brooks again in, in Cameroon. Um, Helen, are you there? Helen Brooks, are you there? Um, we're having some technical issues um, with getting through to Helen Brooks. So what I'm going to do is to bring this webinar to a close. Um, what we have is a recording of the webinar so far. We have the video which explains the relevance of the professional standards and we have the presentation from Catherine Stara. We're going to put those on our website at globalprotectioncluster.org and I encourage everyone uh, to uh, go to the website for those materials. Um, also on the ICRC website, there are some other practical materials which help you to apply the professional standards in practice. Thank you very much to everyone for attending today. Particular thanks uh, to our speakers who, uh, despite their valiant efforts, uh, were let down by their technical difficulties. Uh, thank you very much and Merry Christmas.